Thurgood Marshall, America's first African-American Supreme Court Justice. The grandson of a slave on his mother's side and the great-grandson of a slave on his father's side, Thurgood Marshall was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 2, 1908. The younger of two sons of William and Norma Marshall. Although Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall has been eclipsed by the Civil Rights Movement's most famous spokesman, Martin Luther King, in many ways Marshall's legacy is as important. While King's soaring oratory about equality remains inspirational, Marshall's work governed how the United States extends minority rights to this day. When Marshall was two, his mother Norma moved the family to Harlem so Norma could do graduate work in education at Columbia University. They moved back to Baltimore in 1913 when Marshall was five. Norma worked as an elementary school teacher for more than 25 years. No department store in Baltimore allowed blacks to shop there. Downtown Baltimore did not open a single restroom that blacks could use. Marshall once noted that the only difference between the Baltimore of his youth and the Deep South was that public transportation wasn't segregated. Marshall's dad was the first African American to serve on a grand jury in Baltimore. On his days off, he enjoyed listening to lawyers' arguments at the local courthouse, sometimes bringing his sons before returning home to debate the cases with them. These dinnertime discussions had a profound influence on the future jurist's career choice. The nation's total wealth more than doubled between 1920 and 1929, and commercial radio broadcasting began in 1920, the same year women won the right to vote. On paper, blacks had won that right in 1870, but in the South, poll taxes and literary tests were imposed to disenfranchise them. Meanwhile, the white supremacist Ku Klux Klan saw a resurgence, originally founded in 1866 after the Civil War by Southerners opposed to Reconstruction. The KKK faded away until William Joseph Simmons revived it in 1915 broadening its appeal by targeting not only blacks, but Jews, Catholics, and foreigners. Marshall attended Baltimore's Colored High and Training School, where he was a better than average student and star member of the debate team. His most noteworthy accomplishment was memorizing the entire U.S. Constitution had begun when he was forced to learn key sections as punishment imposed by a teacher for breaking school rules. Marshall knew he wanted to go to college, but since funds were tight, he began working as a delivery boy and a waiter. Upon graduating high school in 1925, at the age of 16, he followed his brother to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania the nation's first degree-granting black university, but taught by an all-white faculty. But to pay the bills, he worked two jobs, supplementing that income as a card sharp. Just before graduating in 1930, despite his mother's objections, he married his first wife, Vivian Burry. Marshall's discipline paid off. He rose to the top of his class, gaining the attention of Harvard Law School-educated Dean Charles Hamilton Houston, who sought to use the U.S. Constitution to fight for equal rights for minorities. Marshall joined the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, the nation's largest and oldest civil rights organization. The NAACP came into being because many of the issues that were facing African Americans uh, were not just a matter of being denied equal transportation, uh, not just being able to sit at lunch counters. Uh, African Americans were literally being threatened uh, in terms of their lives. Uh, there were race riots uh, in many of the cities in the South that 
were literally creating a situation where it was unsafe uh, to be African-American in certain communities. The NAACP's ambition was to secure for all people the rights set forth in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, which guaranteed an end to slavery, the equal protection of the law, and the right to vote regardless of race. Marshall's involvement with the NAACP proved seminal. At the age of 25, Marshall graduated first in his class from Howard Law and soon passed the bar. He went into private practice in 1933 in the depths of the Great Depression, hardly the best time to launch a legal career. He soon found himself in debt. Keeping active in the NAACP, he was hired as a part-time counsel in 1935. Through this group, Marshall found his career path. They forced the University of Maryland Law School to admit his first black student, just five years after that same school had rejected Marshall due to his race. Another case affected Maryland African-American teachers, like his mother, who were only getting half the pay of their white counterparts. By the end of the decade, he ultimately convinced a federal court to declare unequal salaries for public school teachers unconstitutional. In 1938, he became chief counsel for the NAACP in New York. He moved back to Harlem with his wife. Marshall's work fighting for black rights was challenging and hazardous. As NAACP counsel, Marshall used the Constitution to successfully argue for a slew of rights now taken for granted, such as prohibiting real estate covenants that excluded black buyers and invalidating all white primary elections. One of the things that Thurgood Marshall understood in terms of applying the Constitution uh, to issues such as discrimination in housing, a white person should not be treated differently than a black person. They have to be treated the same. That's a very powerful thing because the Constitution itself is now being used as a manner in which you can go to court and challenge the institutional segregation that existed at the time. Well, uh, just what's happening already, I don't know, it's a rumor I read in the paper where they have two colored uh, school teachers now in Levittown. So that's just a good example of what is going to happen. Well, what's wrong with that? I do not like it. I, I have uh, two daughters and two sons, and if there's too many colored people around here, I definitely will get out. I'm not thinking my... Well, I don't want her associating with colored people. Some of the people are definitely against integration. But the whole trouble with this integration business is that uh, in the end, it probably will end up with, with mixing socially. And you will have, well, I think their aim is mixed marriages and becoming equal with the whites. Pretty soon, my neighbor will be having a Negro son-in-law or a uh, daughter-in-law. How would that look? Definitely against mixed marriages, and that's eventually what it's going to come to. If children are raised together, they're not going to think of anything of marrying together. Well, I just could not live beside them. I don't feel that they should be oppressed. But I moved here. One of the main reasons was because it was a white community. And that's the only place I intend to live. If I have to leave Levittown, I will do so. Yes, as I gaze upon this great historic assembly, this unprecedented gathering of young people, I cannot help thinking that a hundred years from now, the historians will be calling this not the peak generation, but the generation of integration. For 25 years, he served as the NAACP's chief counsel. His most extraordinary case was the pivotal Brown versus Board of Education, a name given to five cases that were combined by the U.S. Supreme Court. Marshall argued that separate school systems for blacks and whites were inherently unequal, violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. When they met to decide the case, 
the Supreme Court justices realized they were deeply divided. Unable to come to a conclusion, by the June 1953 end of the term, the court decided to rehear the case in December of that year. The delay threw the NAACP into crisis since its legal defense fund was nearly out of money. It sent out an emergency appeal to keep it going. Fate also intervened. Chief Justice Fred Benson died and was replaced by California Governor Earl Warren. After the case was reheard, Warren was able to bring his colleagues together in a unanimous decision delivered May 14, 1954, declaring segregation in public schools unconstitutional. Marshall's wife Vivian, when she was 44, was misdiagnosed as having the flu. Instead, it turned out to be incurable lung cancer. Marshall suspended all other work to care for her for nine weeks until she died in February of 1955. Marshall, at the age of 47, married Cecilia Suyat, a secretary at the NAACP. They went on to have two children, Thurgood Marshall Jr., who became an attorney and an aide to President Bill Clinton, and John W. Marshall, who served as the first African-American Director of the United States Marshal Service and Virginia's Secretary of Public Safety. Marshall's lawsuits finally garnered results for Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers in the more than year-long Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott, which was sparked by Rosa Parks' refusal to give her seat to a white man. The black leaders at the time, spearheaded by Martin Luther King, said, why don't we just stop riding these buses altogether? But one of the interesting things is that three quarters of the riders of the buses in Montgomery, Alabama were black. Yet they were forced to sit in the back of the bus and they were forced to give up their seats for white passengers. What they said was that, you know what? If you're not going to allow equality, we're not going to ride the buses altogether. Now, nowadays, it seems like that was the right thing to do, but it was a very historic thing that they did at that point because it hadn't been done before. On November 13, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that the policy of relegating blacks to the back of the bus was unconstitutional. No man had a bigger hand in dismantling legal segregation. Between 1940 and 1961, Marshall argued 32 cases before the Supreme Court, winning 29 of them. Thurgood Marshall dedicated his life to these kinds of cases. And as a result of that, uh, he was always going back to the United States Supreme Court. To have two or three or four cases would be extraordinary, but to have more than 30, uh, such as he had, meant that he was continually challenging uh, the limits of constitutional jurisprudence. He was continually taking it to the next level. And he knew how to frame the issues in such a way that would get the Supreme Court's attention so that they would grant what is called certiorari to hear the case. In September 1961, President John F. Kennedy appointed Marshall a judge on a U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Not one of the 98 opinions he wrote was reversed by the Supreme Court. Thurgood Marshall's legal opinions when he was on the appellate court were so sound that they were never reversed. The Supreme Court never said that he got it wrong when he was on the appellate court. And that's the type of record that reflects fundamental strength of logic in his opinions. And part of the reason why he was probably such an effective appellate court justice is because he was such an effective trial lawyer. 
In 1962, James Meredith became the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. The ensuing riots caused President Kennedy to send it 5,000 federal troops. In May 1963, during civil rights protests in Birmingham, Alabama, Commissioner of Public Safety Eugene Bull Connor turned fire hoses and police dogs on black protesters. The nationally televised images built sympathy for African Americans. In January of 1964, the 24th Amendment abolished the poll tax, which had been used in 11 southern states to keep poor blacks from voting. The law changed such that black people were allowed to vote, which presented a problem for many of these counties uh, that were segregated and that were trying to impose segregation. Because the law said that they had to let black people vote. So they had a choice that was a very difficult choice for them. They could either outright break the law and forbid blacks from going to the polls, but then they would have a problem because they would be flagrantly going against the tide of the law. So they invented this concept, which was called the poll tax. And that basically meant that you had to pay to vote. Well, the only people that the poll tax was imposed on were black people in these segregated counties that they didn't want them to vote. In July, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was enacted outlawing discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in schools, at the workplace, and in public accommodations. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law in July by President Lyndon Johnson. It ended racial discrimination in voting. The next month, Johnson named Marshall the nation's first black solicitor general to conduct government legal action before the Supreme Court. As solicitor general, he won 14 of his 19 cases. His biggest case as solicitor general involved the June 21, 1964 murder of three civil rights workers James Cheney, 21, a Mississippi black, and two white New Yorkers, Andrew Goodman, 20, and Michael Swerner, 24, who had been registering black voters in Mississippi. To understand the legal significance of that, you have to understand the difference between the federal government and the state government. The federal government has a law enforcement wing that is called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Local governments usually have local police forces. The civil rights workers that were killed, their murder was sanctioned by local law enforcement. It took the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, uh, which operates on behalf of the United States government, uh, to prosecute this case. And when you have uh, an action that is deemed to be a civil rights violation, uh, that's something that is federal in nature. And one of the ways that this particular homicide was able to be uncovered uh, is through the application of federal civil rights laws uh, to this local law enforcement agency. Had the federal government got, not gotten involved, the entire homicide would have been swept under the rug and nothing would have happened. Marshall argued that the KKK members were agents of the state because they acted in concert with law enforcement. The Supreme Court agreed. After two years as Solicitor General, Marshall was nominated to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court by President Lyndon Johnson, who declared it was the right thing to do, the right time to do it, the right man, and the right place. I believe he has already earned his place in history, Johnson said but I think it will be greatly enhanced by his service on the court. On October 2nd, 1967, at the age of 59, Thurgood Marshall became the first African American to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. He never forgot where he came from, consistently ruling in favor of the rights of organized labor, racial minorities, the advancement of women, the broadening of rights to freedom of expression, 
and the narrowing of police authority. Harvard professor Randall L. Kennedy wrote, no member of the Supreme Court has ever been more keenly alive to social inequalities. In increasingly poor health, on June 27, 1991, Marshall submitted his resignation to President George H.W. Bush. Marshall died of heart failure on January 24, 1993, at the age of 84. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. After his death, Thurgood Marshall was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian award by President Bill Clinton in November 1993.